you know, uh, with Dr. Pierce, he's, he's known to many of us, not only from the time that he spent here with us at the Mayo Clinic, but also the fact that uh, as he has worked in St. Vincent's Hospital, he continued to be an extraordinarily uh, important colleague for us. I think that when I look and I ask in the community who is the go-to spine surgeon, I uh, used to be two people, you know, Dr. Nottmeyer and Dr. Pierce, and then we were able to convince Dr. Nottmeyer to join us back. So now it's only Dr. Pierce in the community when it comes down to spine surgery. So uh, hopefully um, you'll see why, why he is uh, such an extraordinarily thoughtful person and what makes him so special, not only as a colleague, but also as a physician, as a surgeon, as an innovator. Uh, he, as you, uh, some of you guys will know, he was here with us for a number of years. He did his bachelor's at UNC and then medical school in Pittsburgh, residency in Pittsburgh, and then came here from 2009 to 2015, uh, just about a year and a half before I came. He had already left the practice and uh, he has been working in Ascension Medical Group multiple awards, tons of uh, recognition from patients, you know, uh, tons of publications. He continued to publish with our team, by the way, here at the Mayo Clinic, collaborating, continues to do so. And you can actually see his age index of about 13, his impact in the literature, which is extraordinarily important, given the fact that he has been really at a, at a, at a great hospital and continued to reach back to his uh, place of origin here at the Mayo Clinic uh, for academic work. So we're very, very excited about the work that he's done and the um, talk that he's gonna be giving us today, coral surgery is, uh, as a paradigm shift. So I'm gonna stop sharing right here. Steve, I uh, give it away for you. We're very excited to have you and thank you for joining us early at 6.35, he was already logged in. So we thank you. Thank you. I think I'll have my screen. Uh, can you all see the screen? Yes, we'll see it very well. Okay, very good. I got the <clears throat> Google slides here. So thank you, uh, Dr. Quinones, for giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, very kind introduction. And um, we're going to talk about corridor surgery as kind of the new paradigm for spinal operations. I'll explain why I chose this title. And I am um, here at uh, St. Vincent's right down the road, and I look forward to contributing to your team in about a year. Um, <clears throat> disclosures, none of these are particular to this presentation. Oh, sorry, I'm going to the Sorry, save the other participant here. <clears throat> this will be more of a qualitative than quantitative discussion. And um, so I'll be using a frequent picture of clip art and, and, and use a lot of metaphors. Uh, you'll likely leave with more questions uh, than answers. And truthfully, part of this is because I'm going to start getting into the, the research side. I'm really just passing out a line and hoping to gather some interest from some of the younger um, residents and, and some of the fellows to, to show you how interesting spine can be. And uh, I think we'll get a lot of good hits here. I think we'll get some good catch, uh, some fish, and um, we'll make a, good, uh, make a good career for me out of this. <laughs> so with the plan, <clears throat> what is corridor surgery? Why is corridor surgery an important concept for the spine? the uh, evolution of minimally invasive neurosurgery, some case examples, and what is necessary for the paradigm shifts, and what is a possible future. We'll get into that a little bit. And I will move along a little bit quicker here so we can all get back to our duties. So this is my first metaphor, traditional spine surgery approaches. From a cynical view, most people viewed spine surgery over time as the whole world is a nail when you have a big hammer. Every surgery was done with a midline incision. You basically ripped the muscles off of the bones and you only had two decisions. How many levels are you gonna treat? And are you gonna put hardware in or not? Now that obviously it was more complex than that, but for the outsider view, that's basically what it boiled down to. And also has a second part of the metaphor that if you're a patient and you signed up for spine surgery, you knew that you were about to get whacked. So corridor surgery, the reason why I chose this title is one of my uh, publications in residency. Um, we wrote this with uh, Dr. Sam and Dr. Corral was listed as one of the, the mentors on one of the previous publications here. And actually, Danny Prevodello is a very good friend of mine in residency whenever I was at Pittsburgh. Um, but we basically had a very unfortunate child here with a terrible clavicordoma. He's one of several children in his family and the family just didn't really pay too much attention to him. He was always known as a clumsy child until he really started to decompensate. But we really 
try to figure out a way to get this tumor out and leave him with no deficits. And we did anterior, several different stage anterior approaches. We went bilateral and then also posterior to stabilize uh, the cranial cervical junction. And um, we actually had a better resection in this. I'm not sure why uh, this is the only picture I have left from that um, series, but um, you know, at least for the a few years left that I had there, you can see the kid did very well and he had new, new neurologic deficits. Um, obviously, he's probably going to have recurrent so in a few years. Um, but corridor surgery is basically the essence of male invasive neurosurgery. We want to find a pathway to perform the necessary procedure to protect, decompress, and or stabilize critical neural structures while minimizing damage to the surrounding organs, the vessels, and support structures. It's not a foreign concept. I'm not unique with thinking of corridor spine surgery. If any of you go to any spine conference, you can almost play a drinking game for how often you're going to see this slide or some version of this slide shown on the podium. There's many different ways, and everyone is working on finding proper corridors to the spinal column. It goes all the way back to the 1950s. Ralph Cloward and the Smith Robinson technique for ACDF basically found a way to avoid stripping all the posterior muscles of the neck and had revolutionized the way that we treat neck pain and cervical radiculopathy by that anterior approach. But it is not a corridor in between some of those dangerous structures of the anterior neck, which at the time was panned uh, by many uh, experts and, and many articles written about how dangerous it was to operate on the anterior neck to find the spinal column. But now it's basically what we do every single day. So why is it an important concept? You know, we're, it basically goes about the paraspinous muscles. And I'll kind of go through these pretty quickly because paraspinous muscle atrophy and paraspinous muscle integrity is what matters for supporting your spinal column. Uh, the paraspinous muscles provide nutrition to the bones. The bones and the discs and the facet joints don't have very good nutrition. They don't get good vascular supply. So paraspinous muscle health is very important to them. There's even now a new product that's FDA approved for paraspinous muscle stimulation to help back pain. So use this uh, metaphor for middle invasive surgery in, in all fields, not just neurosurgery, all fields. I basically took a picture of a tornado and turned it on its side to show that there's many different ideas that start off with what people think are gonna be the next step in progress. And you still have some people, even though there's a trend moving in a direction where most people are buying into, you still have people kind of out here on the side thinking that their idea is gonna be the one to work and they're kind of working on it, but it's a little bit messier. And eventually it gets more refined, more refined, more refined. And then we finally get into some of the procedures that are very familiar to us nowadays. But almost everything we do had many different correlates and many different options before we actually get to what we're doing on a daily basis. And so I just highlight a couple of photos, mainly based on brain surgery. I came from Pittsburgh in my training. And you know my mentors were some of the leaders in, in finding less invasive ways to treat our brain conditions. You know, Dave Lunsford you know, worked with Lars Lexell to bring the gamma knife over to North America. Um, and all the way back since 1940s when Lars Luxell developed his brain. I found even an article back in the 1880s with an encephalometer where they started doing actually procedures in living humans uh, to try to find a male invasive way to get into the brain. They did not have eloquent tools at that time, obviously. And brain surgery was, was not very safe for, for many decades following. And the vascular procedures, uh, Alad Levy is now the chairman at Buffalo. Uh, he did his training with Nick Hopkins. Michael Horowitz is also one of the early adopters to endovascular procedures. And um, Amin Kassam uh, became my chairman halfway through my residency and, and really helped to pioneer uh, the endoscopic endonasal approaches. And we even see intraoperative MRI with navigation, a you know, publication by Dr. Q. That was over two decades ago. Quick aside on, on this procedure, many of you are probably familiar with this NICO brain path. Uh, Danny Prevedello, when he was at Pittsburgh, was actually very prominent in getting this uh, started. So <clears throat> we also had a very innovative surgeon there, Haydong Joe, who, before I in mean, Kassam's career, uh, did a lot of minimally invasive brain and spine surgery, where he just basically just cut the tips off of syringes and used those as his minimally invasive tubes. We then translated firstly with colloid cysts using the Lexel frame. We targeted a needle right down where we wanted to go find a good pathway, splitting the white matter. We called it gold member from the Austin Powers movies. So that kind of tells you the time of when we kind of came up with that tool. And then just simply passed a cutoff syringe over that blunt device and pulled the needle out, pulled the gold member out. And we had our tube to do our colloid cysts. And then we started doing gliomas and different brain surgeries with it. 
and then that's kind of spawned a Nico brain path. But just notice the tubes that you end up using with, with that Nico look very similar to these syringes. That's not an accident. So my career has been spine. So minimally invasive spine, most people think of metrics tubes. Um, and that's how you know things have taken off. There are many different ideas before the metrics tubes. And actually the original metrics tubes had a port for an endoscope to be put in. But most people don't use that little port because the endoscope was always getting clogged up and it was taking up part of the working channel. So most people just use a microscope when they use a tube. Um, I won't read this quote. I'll let you guys kind of read that. I'll just speak to Rick Fessler who was one of my mentors. I was um, awarded one of the clinical traveling fellowships through the North American Spine Society. It was a little bit of a different spine fellowship than most where most people go for one year to one place. This was a traveling fellowship where I had six months and I went to four different places and kind of found the experts around the country and just really dug in and try to find out what they were doing with their practice. So I spent time with Rick Fessler in Northwestern and, and he really taught me a lot about the minimally invasive approaches. And, and if you look at his quote, basically his definition of minimally invasive is all about preservation of the paraspinous muscles. There's many different definitions of what people will call minimally invasive spine surgery, but I think preservation of the paraspinous muscles is really the, the key feature of all of them. Um, and again, it, it's progressed. You know, there's been actually interdiscal work done for several decades. Um, you know, Parvis Camden came in in the 1980s. That's kind of the, the key thing that really started endoscopic spine surgery uh, that we are aware of now. And it's been progressive over the last three decades. I've made multiple incremental improvements in terms of some of the tools um, and just improvements in technology. So in order to get minimally invasive spine surgery accepted, um, basically it has to work. And if you're gonna get acceptance, it has to be following the needs of the surgeon, has to improve the procedure. Because many of the spine surgery we're doing now are pretty good. We can still get better. And that's what I plan to spend the next 20 years of my career, is how are we gonna get better? Things are good, we want better. And the key of long-term outcomes is really getting people better in the short term, and then it has to be sustained. And so we need to get the nerve roots properly decompressed, and you gotta minimize collateral damage to all the other structures. So we can do decently well. You know, this is a metrics laminectomy, you can see you know, reasonable stenosis here. You can get reasonable decompression and see the spinal fluid opened up again and, and even work into the lateral recess a little bit. Um, but then we kind of think, you know, what is the ultimate minimally invasive corridor? Well, that's really going to be an endoscope, you know, when you get in there. Instead of using a 18 millimeter tube or 20 or 22 millimeter tube with a probably one inch incision, we can get this down to, you know, a nine millimeter incision. And if we can still get the same work done, that's going to have you know, less damage to the surrounding tissues. And there are plenty of studies showing some of the benefits for endoscopic spine surgery. We'll get into that a little bit later, but it has progressed. And really it's been the tools that have been, you know, particularly this guarded drill and high-speed electric drills, which is kind of opening the door for doing many more procedures uh, through the endoscope. But I cannot highlight enough that you must thoroughly understand the anatomy before embarking on an endoscopic adding endoscopic spine surgery to your armamentarium. And so, you know, brief history, the whole neurosurgical focus, uh, the whole journal was focused on various endoscopic spine approaches a couple of years ago. Um, and then it has evolved. And you can see as the endoscopes have evolved, they've gotten a little bit bigger, you know, not too much bigger, but in the ports and the tools have all improved to improve what we can do. So I'm going to show just a little, uh, and this actually is the idea that came from, you know, Dr. Sam's lectures he would always give about microscopy versus endoscopy, is um, I found a perfect uh, correlate. I was rounding in the ICU at, at uh, Riverside, uh, one of our hospitals, nice new ICU, beautiful view of the river, look down the hallway, and you want to see the river, but truthfully, when you're looking down that metrics tube, there's a lot of stuff on the side. A lot of light gets reflected from your microscope from the sides of that tube. And you still are kind of focused on the river, but this stuff is kind of noise that kind of can distract you. Whereas if you take the endoscope in and put it right down where the tissue is, if this is a spinal column, you put the camera right there, well, lo and behold, not only do you get a better view of the spinal column, but also you see this other little part that was jutting out. You do not see that over here. And this could be kind of like that exiting nerve root. You want to get that proximal exiting nerve root decompressed on a laminectomy on the contralateral side. You're reaching in with your kerosin. You're reaching in through here, you're taking a blind bite and you might not either A, get it well decompressed enough or B, 
spike the nerve root and get either a neural tear or a nerve root injury. And so when you have the scope down there, you can actually see it, look at it, and make sure it's properly decompressed and keep it safe. Here's another um, kind of metaphor example. You know, this is endoscopy. This is a place that everybody on this phone call is very familiar with. Um, this is when you first place the scope. But again, you have to be very familiar with your surrounding anatomy and what you're seeing. So you pull the scope back, and when you do put the endoscope in, you get a little bit of perspective, and then you, then you get to work. Uh, some of you might gather where we are right now. And I'm going to compare this to putting in a metrics tube. And then you really get a, a wider range and view of, of, of where we are. And it obviously, it's nothing compared to the view you have when you have an open exposure. If you're going to split the spine and splay all the tissues out of the way, you see exactly where you are. This is right outside the uh, Mangorium building. But again, you want to be very familiar. And that, that's where the tricky part comes in training, because we need people to be familiar with all the tissue, where all the danger is, and all the surrounding areas. But then we need to start training you on how to do it minimally invasively, and then eventually move into endoscopically. But it takes a, a lot of time and, and practice, and that uh, simulation center is going to be a big part of uh, helping us train. So continuous irrigation during endoscopy is another transition, working from an air-based medium to a water-based medium. And actually, the water-based work is very helpful. First of all, the scope doesn't cloud, uh, doesn't cloud up like it does when you do uh, endoscopic skull-based procedures or other endoscopic procedures in an air-based field. Uh, when it's underwater, the scope stays clean. It actually gives a little bit of uh, hemostasis because it applies the pressure for you. It flushes out the small bleeder so you can actually identify the exact bleeding source instead of just bovying or bipolaring the whole area. Uh, therefore, you avoid some of the collateral damage, um, better identification of the macroanatomy, and you can even use the irrigation to help you uh, separate some of the tissue layers. And that's also used whenever you're splitting a fissure for an aneurysm or something like that. Some of the brain surgeons can kind of understand the, the benefits of using uh, irrigation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to go through these pictures pretty quickly. These are just pictures I took at a recent course, uh, kind of showing a different approach. And that's the other thing. It's a very patient-specific approach when you start doing endoscopic spine surgery. Um, but there's extrapyramidal disc herniations work pretty nicely. But again, you'll see the pathology prior to the nerve root. And so it does take a little bit of time to get comfortable. And it's a little bit nerve-wracking when you, you land right on the disc protrusion. You don't see the nerve. So um, that's one key with doing far lateral discs. Um, this is really nice for a lateral transpyramidal approach as well. This goes into Camden's triangle. Again, you kind of basically make the incision at the posterior facet line, um, and then you draw a horizontal line at the disc, and that's how you kind of make your uh, incision and kind of work through there. Um, there's interlaminar approaches. You might not even need to do any bony removal at all. You just kind of make it cut a little hole in the ligament and flay them, and then you can use this sheath for the endoscope as your nerve root retractor. You just kind of rotate it right in, get the nerve root out of the way, and you see right into the disc protrusion, and that's a little bit more of a familiar working angle to the spine surgeon. If over the top laminectomy, which is very similar to the techniques utilized for a metrics tube uh, laminectomy, um, you can go biportal over the top laminectomies. And uh, here's something I've started in my own practice is kind of as part of the transition to endoscopic work is using a metrics tube to come in as far lateral as I can and using the longest tube uh, possible, those eight, nine millimeter uh, metrics tubes. But you come in laterally and just remove that superior articulating process to really get that exiting nerve root decompressed, that outside in approach. Because otherwise, when you come inside out, you're taking off this whole medial facet complex, you're destabilizing the spine. If you want to get the nerve root decompressed all the way out here. Now, we have angled Pearson's you can kind of reach around and bite, which, which I've been utilizing for years. But really, a lot of the tissue, you don't need to take all that off. It would be best to kind of come outside in and just kind of hit right where the nerve needs to be taken. And you can still preserve this facet joint. Even though it's not a great facet joint in most of these patients, it's still nice to preserve it to try to stave off that fusion for a few years. Uh, so inside out lateral recess stenosis, that's more typical to what our approaches are now. Uh, you can do posterior cervical pheromonotomies and discectomies, but you know you don't want to have the irrigation pressure as high, obviously, because you're working near the spinal cord. I'm not going to show you pictures of this transdiscal approach. I think that's a little bit bold um, to kind of put that needle right through and then and use Soniger technique to get through the cervical disc. There's a lot of tissues that can be injured by that. I still think the ACDF approach is pretty good for that. Um, so what are the barriers? And again, I'm going to talk about some of the things that are a little bit more comfortable to discuss and some things that are relatively uncomfortable. Obviously, uh, barriers, time to train. Um, 
there's a learning curve. There's capital purchases as well as per case disposable. We also have to consider the cost of uh, your disposable drill bits and uh, lamy trays that are being processed. Potential for decreased reimbursement uh, with endoscopic procedures. You need to be proactive with the insurance company. Let them know before you're starting these procedures that it is a direct visualization with lights and they should be built to, typical to your laminectomies and discectomies. But there are other procedures out there that aren't using direct visualization to do decompressions and they aren't actually using light. And I'll, I'll show one example of that in a little bit as well. Uh, but this is really like the real operation. If you're not doing a real operation, you're not gonna benefit the patient as much. You know, gaining familiarity with the tools, working angles, visualization, the haptics are a little bit different. Everything is, is a little bit different with this, as well as, you know, bring it into your current workflow. And most people are pretty comfortable with what they're doing. You know, things are going pretty well. Why change? Um, these are some of the more uncomfortable barriers. You know, early on, the messengers were quite abrasive. You know, we'd have people come to our national meetings and tell, you know, well-trained neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons that you're stupid. Um, literally, there was a guy who would go and that was his message. You guys are all stupid. I'm the smartest one in the, in the world. And that ticks a lot of people off. Um, people didn't want to join in on that. Um, you know, legal-based practices. There's a lot of people in Florida doing endoscopic surgery that are not kind of the procedures I'm talking about as much, but they're frequently set up by their trial attorneys. And, and it kind of has harmed the um, adoption until more recently, whenever you have legitimate, good, academic practices and, and we, you know, good spine centers that are actually buying into the endoscopic world is now making it more uh, mainstream and bringing it back into the, into the regular world of spine, spine care. And also reported success rates have not been matched in the general population. That's partly the initial abrasive messenger for reporting zero complications whenever several of us out in the world were taking care of their complications and we knew that they were having complications. They continued publishing and, and speaking at meetings that they weren't having any complications. And so that kind of hurts some of the buy-in. Um, money, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about it, but, you know, this is probably going to take away some of the fusions that pay well to surgeons and hospitals. And the main companies pushing endoscopic surgery are not the main companies that are prominent in spine industry because that exact reason. They get paid to sell their metal, and this endoscopic procedure oftentimes is, is taking away some of that. So the main companies for... Um, Endoscopy, these are the four uh, that I'm uh, either trained or planning to train with, and, and they're all at, at various levels and how aggressive they are in building their American practice. Uh, but Joint Max is the one that probably has the greatest uh, grip here in America and, and has uh, several good um, spine centers uh, throughout the country that have very good teachers and established uh, leaders in the field. Um, so what's on the horizon? Um, again, technology is taken off at a very fast rate. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't as well. Another uh, spot that I went and visited during my clinical traveling fellowship was at Sloan Kettering with uh, Mark Bilski at that time. I went there to kind of talk to him about the GNOME criteria that he had published on. He was just starting his concept of separation surgery that we all aspire to now. And his uh, younger partner is now working on endoscopic uh, procedures for spinal oncology. This is gonna open up new pathways. You know, if you do a, a minimally invasive incision, to get the spinal cord decompressed and then get them to the radio surgery, you can then start your chemotherapy and adjuvant treatments a lot sooner because you don't have a big wound to heal. Uh, they're actually also using the Da Vinci robot for some of their procedures as well. So I'm planning to go to New York during my, uh, my time. I've had this non-compete year that I'm working on now. And I am planning to spend some time up there in New York with them to kind of see how they're, they're doing things. Um, endoscopic fusions, again, the disc is kind of the the area that most people focus on and trying to get fusions. I'm not going to talk too much about biomechanics and the ideal inner body implant. I'm just going to try to keep things moving here. Uh, but there are expandable cages. Obviously, you're not going to put this through an endoscope. But when you, if you do your discectomy prep, pull the endoscope out, you have the cannula in a safe place, you can deploy different um, expandable cages. Uh, just the caution of expandable cages is you're not putting in a snowshoe. Just be mindful that, you know, when you have all the pressure along the edges of a cage that's been expanded. You can develop stress risers and lead to a little bit of subsidence. Um, also, if you kind of crank them up, uh, if this is the anterior column, you want to make them super lordotic. Well, you need to make sure you're doing enough work to release these facet joints or else they're going to have a lot of pain and pressure on those facets. Um, and even if you get a decent heel, they're still going to have some back pain from the pressure on your facet joints. There's footprint expandable cages. These are not my cases initially, but I'm showing just ones that came in to me. 
on call, but you know, it looks like a reasonable placement in the operating room. It comes back in severe pain. You can see it has migrated, and that's a big problem with the expandable cage. You can't just go in and pull it out. That's a really big problem uh, to take care of. And there's another one that came to me, but three months afterwards, where this was deployed and you know, bilateral foot drops. And this patient, unfortunately, required multiple revision surgeries and eventually got him to recover his foot drops, but it took a long recovery. And once this is in there for three months, the bone starts to heal. There's really not much option for taking it out unless you're, you're going to do a big corpectomy. Uh, on that, and that's a, a tricky spot. Uh, another, you know, device that's used for some of these minimally invasive uh, fusions, you know, we got to find a good way to make sure the biologic works. You can get something in there that doesn't take up any space. You can put it through a, a tiny channel, but, you know, we got to make sure it's going to actually heal whenever it's up there in the disk space. I mentioned earlier about um, procedures that don't use direct uh, visualization or light. Uh, the mild procedure, this was 2011, over 10 years ago, this was basically published showing that there is no difference um, that the uh, procedure really does much of anything. Um, it might help patients a bit for a short time. And I thought this was gone, but it actually is reoccurring in the community. I'm seeing many patients talking about it with local uh, pain clinics are offering this procedure again. It's different from what I'm trying to pursue. And this is part of the problem with, with the billing and insurance companies. Um, sorry about that. Um, again, endoscopy should just be one of many tools. If you're going to go into endoscopy, it can't just be, you know, everything becomes an endoscopic procedure. You have to have a lot of tools in your belt. You got to be able to offer more than endoscopy. You can still do corridor surgery. You know, this patient here had lumbar kyphosis um, and ended up having, you know, lateral, anterior, posterior approaches, you know, low thoracic down to the pelvis. Um, and he was wheelchair bound, severe stenosis. So he needed a really, you know, pretty big operation. Um, He's doing a whole lot better, but you know, as with big surgeries, he's probably gonna come back and having a little bit more surgery in the future because he's still a little bit positive, but he's very happy right now. And I told him we'll, we'll follow this for a couple of years and see in a bit. Working towards precision medicine, um, you know, a lot of pre-operative planning and I'll, I'll keep skipping ahead here. Uh, Cause this is a slide that really comes to where the, the main mission of my talk is and hoping to garner some of the interest from uh, the residents and fellows. You know, robots, navigation, endoscopy, they need to be better linked. Uh, there's a recent series in the Red Journal talking about robots in neurosurgery. And they talk about all these cool tools, but don't sleep on the little part there. They talk about radiology. There's gonna be new MRI sequences that you can delineate bone much more definitively. And if we can use our radiology colleagues and collaborate with them to come up with good MRIs, we can then plug these into navigation systems. And if we can get down to sub millimeter precision with the navigation systems, then we can start using robotics to help us with the endoscopic surgery. And it's gonna be a step-by-step -step process. We need to improve the, the drill. Right now, the, the high-speed drills are not high enough speed uh, to do the work that we're used to. Uh, they're also, uh, don't, you can't apply torque to them because they're such a long, skinny shaft. It's endoscopic, uh, you know, we gotta start using ultrasonic uh, bone drill. We have those available in very small hand pieces for skull based work and do very delicate bony work. I think that's probably where the future is going to be. The ultrasonic uh, technology uh, won't have as many dural tears and it's a little bit safer. But again, we got to work with the engineering colleagues to lengthen uh, the probe so we can get it down that endoscopic sheath. Uh, but there is a ton of potential here. And this is where I think most of the publications are going to be coming from uh, in the next several years. Um, I'm just going to touch on a basic healthcare economic problem. It's an aging nation. You can't get away with that. Um, I use the mushroom as the analogy. We have our working population that is paying the taxes and supplying our government with money, but it's basically just a little stock that's a pretty thin stock getting thinner. We have a burgeoning elderly population, but also these other people that are on disability for a variety of reasons at a younger age. And the coronavirus is going to be adding to this mushroom cap growing. Who's going to pay for it? Is it a get while the getting's good kind of situation. Um, but truthfully, we're going to be bundling uh, a lot. We're going to be seeing uh, bundling coming up in the future just because they're simply not going to be able to pay for everything that we're doing nowadays. We're going to need to save money somewhere. Um, we're going to have to offset some of the new technology with decreased expenditures. And will earlier treatment of mild abnormalities end up saving in the long run? Another option for research intervention is is can we surgically stop or slow down degenerative cascade? I'm not going to get into disc degeneration. Uh, but often starts with an annular tear. These histopathologic slides are actually a meniscus, 
and the meniscus is very similar to the annulus in many ways. Obviously, this is a very simplified slide, but we can collaborate with our orthopedic colleagues who have very good tools, used to doing osteoscopic surgery to repair the meniscus. Can we do something like that for the disc annulus? And if we can kind of stop this, where you have a relatively healthy disc with a decent annular tear or annular fissure, if we can repair that now, can we save that disc from degenerating down the road? That's gonna take a lot of time and patience to figure that out. Patients, NTS, many patients, because of the, uh, you know, the number needed to treat is gonna be pretty high to, to make a difference. And also patients, NCE, because it's gonna take many years to really figure out if it makes a difference or not. But that is something to consider over the next 20 years. I brought this picture from Dr. Yoon, former graduate. Uh, there's always gonna be a need for spine surgery. All of these youngsters, hovering over their phones at the Chick-fil-A line at the Atlanta airport. Um, they're gonna be, they're actively degenerating their discs as we speak. That's gonna be a big public health problem. Is that gonna be the future of spinal treatments? If it is, that mushroom cap is gonna get a whole lot bigger and we're gonna have bigger public health problems on our hands. So we need to work with all of our colleagues to figure out a way to slow down spinal degeneration and do things in a less invasive manner. So I think there's great research potential in spine. It's challenging. Um, you know, we're gonna follow some different pathways that we think are really cool, but you're gonna see it come to a dead end. We're not gonna get anywhere. We'll get lost in the woods. We'll have to pick each other up, get back on the main road, get back on the path. And then by the end, hopefully we can get a nice rewarding finish and, and look back at, at some very uh, helpful things that we can offer to patients here uh, throughout the country and the world. Any questions? Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Let's see, Dr. Nat Meyer. Maybe we can, maybe we can, yeah, there you go. Take it away, Dr. Nat Meyer. Hey, can you all hear me? Yes, we hear you very you well. Hear me? Thank you. Yes, all we right, do. Sorry, I had to go on the on the phone with the audio. So, hey, Steve, yeah. great talk. Uh, quick question as far as endoscopic microdiscectomy, talking about the insurance coverage. I mean, are they still giving you the CPT 63030 for that or? Are they trying to um, make that another code with endoscopy or what? So there's a, a few different pathways that's going, but right now the, the pathway is to go 63030 to do a discectomy, um, 6047 if you're going to do a real laminectomy, uh, 6030 if you're going for aminotomy, but it's got to be kind of worked out in advance with the insurance company. And then what about as far as comparing these patients you're doing a metrics tube uh, procedure on, are they really having that much better of a recovery? Uh, is it first the first couple of days easier or is it just in general an easier recovery or what's your opinion on that? So it, it is interesting there, you know, as we know the difference between metric tube discectomy and, and open discectomy, there's no um, publications or any study that shows it makes a difference long-term. Uh, we presume that the difference is really made not in the first year, that in the years following, and as, as they age, which there are no studies that show things five years, 10 years out. Um, but again, I think it's going to be something that we learn uh, over time uh, with it. I think it's more of a situation. Uh, um, it's going to take big data to figure that out. It's going to take the big, you know, the N2QOD and some of the bigger databases. NASA has a big database, and that's, what, that's where we're going to figure out if it makes a difference or not. But you're right. At the early phase, yes, they're getting back to work. Well, earlier they're, you know, they're, they're going to make a quicker recovery and, and not have as much time off. Um, and it, it seems to be a difference, but again, a lot of that is surgeon directed. You know, it's what you let them do. Potentially, some PCORI grants, you know, some prospective trials, which I know that Kingsley is already working even with the wake. Eric, any other questions? Beautiful. Thank you. Let, I'm going to pivot right now. Thank you. I'm going to pivot right now uh, to uh, Selvin, then Gaetano, who raised their hand, and then potentially Olu may want to say something. If you raise your hand, Olu, I'll put you up. So go ahead, Selvin. Take it away. Well, Steve, uh, thanks for that great talk. Um, uh, I guess I have one comment and one question. So first comment is, uh, I think the marriage between robotics and uh, endoscopic spine surgery is an ideal one. Uh, with the endoscope, basically the biggest challenge is finding the proper trajectory. And I think with uh, the robot, getting you set uh, to a uh, preset trajectory, I think that'd be great um, to help propel endoscopic surgery and overcome some of that learning curve. And then my question with regards to the learning curve, do you know of any uh, publications out there that 
uh, will detail surgeons experiences with the learning curve involved, um, how many cases are needed to become proficient, et cetera, because there have been some studies looking at, uh, you know, uh, MIST lifts and MIS surgery through a tube. Do you know of any such studies with endoscopic surgery? Yes, the University of Miami, uh, Mike Wang uh, has a study with that. It, it's, it's almost similar to the MIST lift. It's basically, you know, 20 become, before you start getting somewhat proficient and 40 before you get really comfortable and start driving on the times. You know, 20 is when you have a little bit higher complication rate and that starts to balance out. And then after 40 is when you start getting uh, a lot faster with it. Beautiful, great. And actually, uh, and, and this is a very relevant question. So I did the same thing with my transphenoidals because I learned how to do it microscopically just like Steve did many years ago. And then we started moving to endoscopic and it was 60 cases for me of endoscopy by the time I was proficient and faster with the endoscope through the nose. And I was not using ENT when I did all these cases at Hopkins. So there's definitely a learning curve. And then after that, it gets much faster. Beautiful question. Let's go to uh, Dr. DeBiase. Go ahead. And then uh, I'm going to go to Dr. Akinduro. Go ahead, Caetano. Hi, Dr. Pierce. Thank you. The great talk and great analogies. My question kind of related to Dr. Chen's question. So given the learning curve, are there any good simulators available or how also the cadaver lab plays into helping to aid with the learning curve. Thank you. Exactly, so that's a brilliant, I would say, and timely question. So obviously cadavers are very expensive. Um, new technology that was basically brought to the field by Mayo Clinic. Uh, I think there's a good chance if we can partner uh, with that new company Symergy on the 3D printed uh, simulators. So the benefit of those is that cadavers, you never know if there's really pathology whenever you get in there and open it up. And that makes a big difference, especially when practicing, say, for discectomies or, or extra pyramidal disc protrusions. If you get down there and there's no disc protrusion, you're not really seeing the benefit and you might not get what you need. With the simulator that you can base off the patient's MRI, we can actually simulate parlateral discs and you know regular paracentral discs and pyramidal stenosis and, and basically kind of figure out. I mean, some of the problems with the over-the-top laminectomy is getting the endoscope docked. If you have a really big gnarly facet joint, you don't really have much room to get that scope in. Um, that can be practiced with the, the simulator through Symergy. So, that's something to, to kind of partner with that, you know, that Mayo invention to see if uh, we can kind of work with that. And I'd be excited to kind of do some of that work in that simulation center with some of those uh, to get that started. And that would also be another route for, you know, fellows to get publication to show that this is something that is a legit way to kind of revolutionize training. Yeah, that would be great. Beautiful. Let's go to Dr. Akinduro. Yeah, yeah, thanks Dr. Pierce. Uh, great, very great talk. Um, my question, uh, so this isn't a uh, shot at anesthesiologists, but I, one of my close friends, he's uh, about to do a pain fellowship. And he mentioned to me that a lot of the anesthesiology uh, pain uh, people are doing uh, kind of endoscopic disc work. And even uh, I was shocked. He told me like even discectomies. Uh, one, are you aware of a lot of that? Two, do you think uh, that's going to change the game for how uh, you know, of course, reimbursements and, uh, you know, the number of cases that spine surgeons are doing. And is there anything that needs to be done or should be done about that? What are your thoughts about that uh, in general? So most of them that are doing that are, uh, the, and I didn't put their company logos up there because I'm aware of some of these companies are actually intradiscal work where you actually enter through the canvas triangle. because so that's where most pain physicians are comfortable working in canvas triangle to do their, you know, transfermal injections and, and, and other procedures. So they're entering into the disc and doing intradiscal uh, discectomies. Um, and the way that they're repairing the annulus, they call it annular repair, but they're really just cauterizing the annulus and hoping it shrinks up. Whereas some of the thoughts I was looking at some of the other companies was actually doing real you know, tissue repair uh, with some of the more you know, suture-based techniques that, uh, that we're more familiar with. But they are out there. They're going to be more prevalent. And that's where I, I mentioned it's direct visualization with lights that differentiates our surgery, which is more of what I would call the real neural decompression versus some of their indirect decompression where they base it off of, you know, intradiscal work to try to pull it out that way or basically cauterizing and hoping the tissue shrinks in. Got it. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Beautiful. And I also believe, uh, this is a very good question. I'm going to then go to Dr. Buchanan. I also believe that some of that is going to be, as Steve said, all uh, knowledge of the anatomy is going to be so crucial for people to be able to do this. And I don't think anybody understands anatomy better than all of you who are doing this every day, in and day out. 
to be able to do it right and to show the efficiency and the quality. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Pierce. That's a, that's a great talk, uh, a wonderful narrative review of sort of the corridors uh, to accessing various areas in the spine. I'm curious about your approach. You mentioned over the top decompressions. As you're, you know, I trained with John Liu. Um, the question is, do you typically go ipsilaterally for most of your um, radiculopathies or are some people who always go contralateral to the pathology so they can visualize the nerve root? What are your thoughts on that, um, especially when you have a hypertrophic facet? Exactly. So when I do my metrics, Lammy, I, I typically go ipsilateral to the side where they have worse symptoms. Um, and I do take off a, a pretty decent amount of that medial facet complex. I then have to re-angle the tube. I usually make sure I re-angle it four different directions in every one of those metrics operations. But for me, the lateral recess on the contralateral side, uh, and I have, fortunately I haven't had one in a while, but a little bit higher risk of spinal fluid leaks. So some of those angles of getting that kerosene and bite contralateral can be a little bit complex and that nerve root sometimes gets in the way. But there are many people that espouse going contralateral because it is true, you do see it a little bit better and you can follow it out a little bit further and you can get reasonable decompression. Um, but I stick to where I like if lateral to have a less rate of spinal fluid leak, you know, the rate's been, you know, less than, you know, one and a half percent over the last couple of years, but I just hate it if it happens because the spinal fluid leak in a minimum invasive case can frequently lead to an upper jaw hematoma and a bigger problem. Good. And then the other question I had for you is, you know, endoscopic spine surgery. I went to a talk once where um, there was a debate between Hofstetter uh, out in Seattle and basically there was a traditional person who had an open uh, decompression and their incision was two, three inches. And then someone did, Jean Lu presented on uh, metrics tubes and his incision was the size of a quarter. And then obviously opposite presented is and the incision was the size of a dime. The question becomes if, if all these patients are going home the same day, well, typically the, the latter two, uh, more so than the open, if all those patients are going home the same day, does it really make a difference? How do you justify the cost of basically revamping an entire OR because it's a completely different setup for doing uh, endoscopic surgery than it is for doing metrics, for example? Yeah, and that, that's a perfect question. Now, I, I think with laminectomy, it's a little bit different because of the open laminectomy, you're removing that uh, interspinous ligament. And I think that does make a difference when you take down the spinous processes and interspinous ligament um, and you get bilateral, um, you know, cautery of the paraspinous muscles. So I do think there's a difference there to open lamy versus the metric tube lamy. But you're right. If they're all going home the same day, which they are, and I still do open laminectomies. I'm not doing all minimally invasive laminectomies. Uh, there's some cases that just need to be opened up to get them properly decompressed. Um, you have to have all three options is what, in my opinion, is, is, is viable. But you're, you're right, just like uh, not my RS, there's no evidence to say that it makes a difference now. I think in theory, if you think of it's better preservation of the paraspinous tissues, it should work out with time in theory. Uh, the endoscope is going to be something we're going to be able to hook up to robotics navigation a little bit better than obviously the metrics tubes, um, which is where I think the future of spine surgery and the future of all of our surgeries and various surgical specialties are going to go. Um, but your, your question is, is right on. We have no evidence and it's going to take time and, and probably going to be years down the road before it makes a difference because the difference between a, an incision the size of a quarter versus an incision the size of a dime, you know, that may not make a difference at all in the short run for sure. And it may or may not make a difference five, 10 years down the road. That I don't know. And, and I don't think we're going to have that answer for a while. Beautiful. I'll take one more question from Bucaramanga in Colombia. Dr. Vargas. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great uh, talk. And uh, of course, always this kind of uh, talks give us uh, uh, a sense of how, what is the route for, for go. But uh, my question is, I have endoscopic and minimal invasive surgery since long time ago, doctor, uh, uh, as you show in your, in your talk. Why do you think that the neurosurgeons still are doing more microscopic approaches to, to the compression and not take the endoscopic approaches as similar. I think that many times because the results are not as bad as maybe some people try to say, but why is the main reason for the neurosonius not to follow that route of endoscopic surgery 
instead of remain in microscopic surgery for many of the decompressive uh, surgeries? Okay. So that's a very good question. So in uh, Asia and Germany, um, way more penetrance of endoscopic spine than in America. Um, I think there's obviously surgeon comfort with their current techniques. Uh, to do the bony work is a lot more work uh, for the surgeon and, and it's taking a little bit more time until you get through that learning curve. Uh, the tools for the bony removal are still not quite where they need to be. Uh, I mean, the kerosens are very small kerosens that you can get down at endoscopic uh, sheaths. So really the kerosens are better for soft tissue uh, than bone. The bone kerosens are just removing a very small amount of bone and it's multiple bites and each, each pass takes a long time to get out. So Actually, I just was, was working with a suction kerosene. It actually has a suction port on the kerosene to help kind of pull the tissue out. That way you don't have to keep pulling the tissue and, and pulling your uh, kerosene out. You just kind of bite, 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 and the suction takes that tissue out. And you know, as these tools evolve and get better, that's where I think the, the bonus is going to be. But right now, you know, there's not much of an impotence because the questions that were asked are true. There's not really an outcome difference between the microscopic versus endoscopic uh, outcomes. And so why shift your practice in that direction, you know, and really the reason why I gave the talk is that I think I'm more looking towards the future and where I want to be in 20 years, not so much where I want to be in 2021, but where do I want to be in 2030, 2035, which I think the world is heading that way, but it's going to be a, a it's going to be a slow evolution. We need the new devices, we need the new inventions, we need the new equipment, we need new intellectual property, potentially we need to start our own companies and so on and so forth. So Steve, beautiful talk, amazing. You see all the comments. I actually see John Pierce right here. You mind making an introduction, Dr. Pierce, as to who John Pierce is? <laughs> well, I don't know if my dad is still on the line. I forwarded him the link. So my father actually is turning 90 uh, in what, five or six weeks. Um, but he is a you know phenomenal man, has a story, I would say almost, you know, not, not quite to your level, but you know, born and raised in, in Greece, born in 1931. Yeah was in, uh, occupied uh, by the Germans and in, in Italians so all of his formative years. And uh, just basically through sheer will and work ethic made his way through America and through a, you know, the old pyramid programs of surgical residencies. And he just went to the best spot he could find which was the University of Minnesota at the time where the people wrote the textbooks. And he just kind of worked his way right through residency, became a urologist, built a you know, beautiful family uh, and raised us in Western Pennsylvania and kind of, you know, basically taught me everything I, I need to know about life and, and where I need to be in my career. Beautiful. Well, welcome. Yep. Welcome, Dr. Pierce. And uh, what an amazing, Dr. John Pierce, what an amazing, uh, you must be so proud of your son. We welcome you. We thank you. Happy birthday in the few days to come. And we're so excited to have your son right here. And hopefully uh, you have a wonderful time seeing, uh, we had eight countries represented this morning, you know, the world, you know, and we have many people. At one point we have up to a hundred people between those who register in those rooms where we have several people all listen to your son. So congratulations and thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for another beautiful talk and we're looking forward to partnering and some endeavors coming up. All right. Thank you. Very good. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.